This is a very special edition of the Public Square. I'm Dave Zanotti, joined today by Rob Walgate and Alan C. Duncan, our executive producer. This is both a post-election and a pre-election update, and it's driven by the incredible intensity of interest that has been exhibited across the nation regarding what's going on in the state of Ohio. Now, full disclosure, because we have many new listeners across the country that aren't familiar with all the details on the Public Square Media Network and where all of this comes from. This broadcast is an outreach of the American Policy Roundtable, which has been around since 1980, uh, a public policy organization that has basically entered into just about any arena that is necessary to impact public policy and to educate Americans on the core principles of our form of civil government and how those core principles flow from a biblical worldview. And then what's our responsibility as responsible citizens to be salt and light in this culture? Uh, we've been around for a long time. We have specialized, not by design, but by necessity, in a number of different things. Voter information, we've been highly involved in that. Obviously, we've been involved in litigation and legislation. We've been involved in the uh, le in learning about how our Constitution works, how our republic was formed, how our courts work. What does it mean to be involved in litigation? How do you actually write laws? It surprises people to know that when lawyers go to law school, they don't learn how to write laws. That's not a part of the curriculum because you can't make any money doing that. So you've got to be in, in, you're trained in the realm of law where you can make a living. So you have different divisions of practice and you study precedent. You don't study the constitution in law school. So you have to go into other postgraduate forms of education to learn how the courts work. What are the big cases? What are the precedents? How do you study? How do you create law? What, what words mean what words mean? A good part of our experience has been on the ground in state houses around the country and on Capitol Hill, learning how laws get written, who actually writes them, who are the people behind the scenes that do the writing when somebody comes up with a great idea. And then you've got to fit it into either the U.S. code or the, or the state uh, revised codes. I think that was one of the biggest surprises for me uh, roughly 20 years ago when I started at the American Policy Roundtable, being invited to speak at a law school to a law class. And we're talking about... The Your wife was surprised you got invited too. Uh, right? Yeah. Well, you <laughs> know, what, you know, and, yeah. you, yes. I always uh, say that law school would have never accepted me as a student, but they permitted me to speak to their students. So there, I have that going for me. I guess. Because you have valuable experience that they don't have, and that the law school professors don't have either. Right, real world experience. But when we talked about the Constitution and the Declaration, and you know, one of the students raised their hand. And they talk about that, and they're like, "Well." You know, we really don't get into that. We would just worry about the precedent, what's already been decided, what someone else has already said that that means. And that, I mean, that kind of blew me away when it came to the training of those those students. It reminds me of a game of telephone. You just keep getting further and further and further away from what the original intent was at some uh, that's point. That's really a great illustration, Alan. And that's what studying precedent in law school does. You study the precedent that was established by the opinions that were rendered in this specific case, whether it's a state uh, Supreme Court or the U.S. Supreme Court. And then you watch future courts um, nibble away or expand on uh, those kinds of uh, precedents and how people will... Through, this, through a series, uh, a strategy called lawfare, how they will move their way into the legal system to try to manipulate the courts to ch actually change laws. Now, lawmaking in our country is designed to be done by lawmakers, and the, those lawmakers are in position constitutionally as the representatives mm -hmm. of the people. So that's the lawmaking body. Uh, in 26 states, if you decide to make a change in your constitution, um, the people of those states have the right, the constitutional privilege to vote to approve or disapprove those amendments. In states like Ohio, every 10 years, there has to be a review. Uh, and in fact, it, it's, I think it was either 10 years or 20 years, there's a constitutional commission that actually meets to propose um, uh, amendments. It's sort of like it's like the dust-up committee. Every every so many years, by law, they have to come back and take a look and see how we're doing with this. And they propose, most of the amendments they propose are rejected because people pretty much like things the way they are. Um, and people don't like change all that much. But today we're talking about the state of Ohio because the state of Ohio is now ground zero on the abortion debate. Um, just last night, we listened to uh, CNN uh, basically say that what happened in 
a special August election in the state of Ohio was a litmus test on the question of abortion for the nation. Well, that's a bold-faced lie. Uh, of course, they're CNN. No one holds them accountable to tell the truth. Uh, and, and so the only people who listen to them are people who want to be lied to and, 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 and want, want to hear that rhetoric. And so that, that's, that's what they want. And so there's no accountability. Same thing with Fox. The only people who listen to Fox are the people who want to hear what Fox is going to tell them. There's no, there's no longer any sense of accountability in journalism to the truth. You're only accountable to your ratings and your ratings are niched into a market that agrees with you because you're no longer feeling the responsibility that was connoted in the First Amendment that a free press would tell the truth for the good of the culture. Now a free press tells their truth to their audience to get paid. And that's the only mechanism of accountability. And unfortunately, there's us who must monitor all of those different stations and all the things that are said. And as I watched CNN on election night in Ohio, I was kind of left scratching my head, and but also reminded of the realization that those folks are unfortunately entertainers as much as they are newscasters. Oh, I, I listened and, to the CNN 9 o'clock key host say that the Ohio Congress had put this measure on the ballot. And I, I thought to myself, now, look, anybody can have a slip. But as I listened more and more and more, I thought to myself, what person in charge of a program of this level doesn't know that there's not a Congress in Ohio? There's a legislature. There's a Congress in Congress yeah. in Washington, D.C. You can't, you, you, can't, you can't make that mistake. And as I watched, I was kind of left scratching my head as they talked about the run-up to the August special election in Ohio. I'm like, you know, you're watching them give a national audience perspective on it. I'm like, these folks haven't been in Ohio during this election because what they're talking about just wasn't happening. I, I actually got a text from Tennessee this morning where someone said, the news is out, big pro-life win in Ohio. Is that accurate? <laughs> I said, I don't know where you heard that story from. Uh, but I mean, it, it, it's not even on the same planet of the reality that what happened at Ground Zero. Now, uh, the other thing is that we have our American Mission Center, the, the, the place that God has given us and the, the wonderful friends of this organization have built and paid for, uh, which is the broadcast center for the Public Square Media Network. And that's a number of products that go out across the country in which we are attempting to uh, teach people and to uh, the principles of America. Now, we have a perspective. We have a worldview. Understand, we are nonpartisan and nonprofit, but we are not void of worldview. We stand for the Declaration of the Constitution, the Northwest Ordinance, the founding documents, and the principles upon which they stand. That's what we do. And we make no apologies about it. And that's not been a, a matter of been appropriated by faith. It's not a matter that we appropriated by being raised up in some tutelage of privilege. It's we've all come to the conclusion that America, the way it was designed, provides the greatest amount of liberty under law, form plus freedom, of any civil society that's ever been constructed. Now, I happen to have spent a little time studying ancient civilizations, and we've got some people around us who have spent lifetimes studying political philosophy throughout all of human civilization, and we've come to the same consensus. America works best because America is the system that is closest to true truth. It's not absolute, it's not perfect, and it's only as good as we live it. But on paper, the premise and promise of America work. So that's where we're coming from. And that's why we are passionate about communicating with people. We didn't draw a straw and say, oh, I got an idea. Let's have a pick. Let's pick Ohio to become ground zero on the abortion debate. It should never have happened here, but it has. And that in and of itself is an intriguing story. It's almost like the premise for a uh, streaming video series because it shouldn't have happened in this state. The statistical um, vote counts over the years it sh this is not the place where the battle should have been. It should have been in other places that were much easier. Now, when you look at Planned Parenthood's map, and this is all about Planned Parenthood, what we're going to be talking about for the next several minutes here is about the abortion industry. And it's important we understand there is an abortion industry. What's going on right now is not driven by a bunch of zealous ideologues who have suddenly discovered that human autonomy is their religion and must be maintained at all costs. That's what the wrapper that they want you to see. But the people who are out there on the front lines advocating for human autonomy and get your hands off my body and all the other stuff that's out there, all those messages, they are tools. 
They are tools in the design of the abortion industry. There is an abortion industry. It is a profitable industry. It makes people good livings. It makes people good money. And it has lots of spinoffs. What is the abortion industry? Its major components of that complex are the abortion providers, Big Pharma, which is now a substantive abortion provider as well because of chemical abortions, which now uh, it probably, I believe I'm correct, chemical abortions are, are more in number now than surgical abortions or will be soon. There's, there, it's almost like a dual industry now. So it's it's the abortion provider, it's big pharma, and it's the matrix media of the left. Now, the matrix media of the left is a part of the industry because they believe that people who support abortion are good to keep their political interests in power, which keeps them connected to both power and money. That's the complex. That's the reality. All the rhetoric is just the wrapping paper. It's the industry that's driving everything and the industry that is paying the bills and the industry that paid the bills in this Ohio fight. So there was a big fight in Ohio. And seeing that there is a ballot issue coming in November, the Republican uh, Party, the majority in the uh, Republican House, not necessarily all the members of the Senate, but enough to get a supermajority, uh, passed out a constitutional amendment to change the threshold of voting in Ohio for constitutional amendments from 50% plus one to 60% plus one. Now, it was without a doubt one of the most failed political strategies we have ever seen in 43 years. It came out of profound controversy and hypocrisy. The Republican legislature had just voted several months earlier to ban August elections because they don't work. They cost $20 million and not enough people show up. They reversed that ban based upon bullying by pro-life leadership and by outside money. People were very shocked by that and even offended by that. They walked into a minefield. Actually, they walked into an artillery fight carrying nothing but a pop gun. You can't possibly move a ballot initiative of this substance that changes over 100 years of established law that tells people, give up your right to change your constitution on simple majority and go to 60% because we say so. Because you should be terrified that if you don't, the world will come to an end. It was a campaign that was driven solely by fear of loss while it was asking people to give something up. In an off-off election year, in August, when the turnout was going to be minimal and your opponents would have every rationale driven by their incredible funding to defeat you. That's what just happened in Ohio. And that issue failed. Is it a litmus test for abortion? Let's talk about it. We will be right back for more on The Public Square. Spreading the light of liberty across the land. Now back to The Public Square. Welcome back to the Public Square, Rob Walgate with Dave Zanotti, Alan C. Duncan, talking today about what just happened in Ohio and much of what we're using as our uh, language of the days comes from the text of our monthly update. Those are written by Dave and sent out monthly. And if you want to get a monthly update, we encourage you to go to aproundtable.org. Give us your info. We're happy to send it to you via the Postal Service. We're happy to email it to you, whatever method you want to receive it, we're gonna send it to you. And there's a lot, this is action packed because the attention of the nation is about to be on Ohio for the next 90 days. So what happened in Ohio, Rob Allen, was a strategic mistake. Uh, It now puts, it, it would be the equivalent of running a mile race with a very formidable opponent and giving that opponent the first 440, is a first lap around the track is a head start. It would be, and something you hit on in segment one that I think is important to to note as well when you talked about the Republicans eliminating August elections in Ohio and then reversing course, I think a number of people that opposed the measure in Ohio did so because of that, because of the hypocrisy, because of how the Republicans handled it. The Republicans didn't step up and say, wait a minute, we were wrong for eliminating August elections. This proves that they're important. This issue is important enough that they didn't say it like that. 
They basically said, no, August elections aren't important when you want to do them. (laughs) When the county thinks they're important, when the local school district, when they're not important, they're only important when we want to do them. People were left scratching their heads saying, wait a minute, the elitist class once again strikes. The people who were promoting issue one, one in 64 of 88 counties, that's pretty significant. But there's about 10 big counties and five really big, big counties in Ohio that you may not have to win to win a statewide election, but you've got to lose them by certain margins. And your margins in the other 64 counties have to be significantly large. It can be done. It's basically how Donald Trump won. And it it can be done. But you don't see that model of turnout in an off-off election year. So you can't get to a statewide model like that. In other words, forget what the issue is, whatever the issue was. Look at the turnout model on how elections work in off-off election years. Then in a special August election, August the 8th, it, it's just it, the strategy of it was just flawed, short-sighted. It, it would take like more than one major miracle. I was seeing a, a turnout uh, or votes cast of, of just over 3 million. Is that fairly accurate? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, and and so so what what could somebody expect in an election that's not an off uh, election? Well, in a, a presidential election, you could see as many as five million votes. Yeah, you Ohio. could see a lot more than that, and that's why we've advocated long at the American Policy Roundtable for constitutional amendment votes only taking place in the fall of even numbered years. But we've seen them in the past. In 2015, there was an attempt to legalize marijuana recreational marijuana in Ohio, and I believe roughly 3.2, 3.3 million people turned out in November of 2015 to weigh in on that vote. Now, I, I, to, in full disclosure, this is not in the newsletter. This is just something we're talking about right here, and God forgive me if I make a mistake. Any thinking person listening to this program is going to say, you know, you guys are pro-life, right? Yeah, we sure are pro-life. Our, our whole motivation for starting what we're doing comes from a passion to protect innocent, unborn human life. And we've been that way for our whole lives, and and that's that's who we are. Well, why can't you pro-life people get together? That's been a question people have been asking for 50 years. I can tell you what the answer is, human sinfulness. Pride, ego, turf, publicity, competing for funding. There's no good answer on why pro-life people can't work together. It's always a bad answer, and it's a sad answer. And what this issue has done is to radically split the pro-life community in Ohio. That's unfortunate. Now, may God forgive us of our sins, because what's coming up in November, the ballot measure that we now need to deal with, is the worst measure of constitutional provision I have ever seen in studying this stuff for a lifetime. It's the worst that we as a team have ever seen. You could be pro-abortion, and if you were being intellectually honest with yourself, would have to oppose the coming amendment because it's so over the top. It is so poorly constructed. It's da- it's actually dangerous. It's extremely dangerous when you look at the vagueness and the open-endedness right. of the language. Now, as soon as I say that, let me, let me, let me put forward. One of the huge sad realities of the campaign that is now over on the previous issue one, because there's a very good chance that this new measure will be called issue one within a matter of days. And there's, by the time people hear this, we'll be inside 80 days inside before the voting begins. That's my fear. I fear that, that some pro-life people will say, didn't I already vote on issue one to protect life? Alan, the confusion is, is rampant. (laughs) All right. It's absolutely rampant. But the, the key is that we've got to remember that we're now moving into a constitutional provision that has to be evaluated for the language. You could be pro-abortion and against this measure because it is so poorly constructed. Now, the issue one campaign used fear dramatically. Fear, fear, fear. Now it's like calling the little boy that called wolf. Now we have something to be genuinely concerned about, actually afraid of because of the consequences of poorly constructed language in the Constitution. And we have criticized conservative proposals as well as liberal proposals over 43 years. If you're going to the Constitution, you are going to the supreme law of the state. 
you can't make language mistakes in there because to change it requires a massive constitutional amendment change to get the words changed. You have to have your language right. We wrote the term limits amendments in, in, in Ohio for constitutional language. We wrote that language. We took over one year to get those measures down to single paragraphs. Single paragraph. You can't have more than you should. A sentence, if you can make it a sentence, especially if you're proclaiming in this constitution to create a right. That's not done. You, 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 humans don't create rights. See previous broadcasts with Dr. William B. Allen about that. You'll see uh, who writes a right, who has the right to do that. Now they're creating a right that's never been seen before, the right to reproductive decisions. And they never even define the totality of what those reproductive decisions are. They list five, but then add, but not limited to these five. So I want to know what's six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. They don't tell you. You see, once you get something in the supreme law of the land, if you've got open-ended clauses, trapdoors, weasel words, someone will come along for any number of motivating reasons and seek to exploit that hole in the thread. Back to the the list of issues that they that they put in there, the first four on the list aren't even in contest in the state of Ohio anyway. We've mentioned that on the show before. So it's really You about, don't need any more no, protection for, for contraceptive rights. There's no there's nobody stopping you. Yeah. And this would be awful statutory law. This would be awful law <laughs> passed by the oh. lawmakers. That the could legislature then, would never, no, pass a, never pass a bill this shoddy. Never. Well, I don't think LSC, the, 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 no, the Legislative the, Service Commission, would, would allow ever, They them. would never draft something they, this They would cruddy. say, no, 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 this is bad. And that's one thing as well. You know, we've asked the question, we've asked it on multiple constitutional amendments. Who wrote the language? Who's the lawyer that wrote the language? I want to know who sat Could there. Who we have their names? We, because I have some questions. Yeah, I'd As love to sit Ohio down. Brought, they're welcome to come right in here and, and go over the language. The people who wrote this can come right into this studio with our document and, and we'll pay their way no matter where they are in the world. We'll pay their day. We'll pay their day wages. We'll, I don't care if they're $600 an hour lawyers. Come on. I don't care if they're $1,000. Come on in. We'll pay your day rate. Come on in and explain this to us. Now, let, it, let us get it in right, like writing. Let us get it on tape so that what you say, you have to stand for. Because we're standing for every word that we're saying. In fact, when you look at this month's update, and, and you're probably going to hear this a lot between now and the end of this broadcast, you're going to hear the words, see the language.com. See the language.com, see the language.com, see the language.com. Because we have done our homework on their language. Now, we'll give credit where credit's due. They are masterful in creating new words, and their proposal is masterful in giving the abortion industry, absolute control over the process and procedures of abortion going forward. It's, it's, it's masterful. They got exactly what they want. The question is, do they have the courage to admit it out loud and tell us what they really are after? And if they're not going to tell you what they're after, we're going to tell you what they're after. And why does that apply to every single person listening to this, no matter what state you live in? Because just today, the Washington Post came out and basically said, this is the template. This is the fight. Not only is this where the abortion business is going to be going for the next number of years, this is the 2024 presidential election. This is their game plan. The president of the United States came out on election night and commented favorably about the defeat of Ohio issue one. The president of the United States on a ballot issue. The president of the United States has absolutely no legal responsibility whatsoever in con concerning a state constitutional debate in Ohio. But he came out because this is a part of Joe Biden's strategy to get reelected. It's a part of part of every the, the members of House. They were all out in that. This to them is electoral politics. It's power politics. And it's brought to you by some of their best friends, the abortion industry and big pharma. That's reality. Now, what is amazing, and Alan, I got to get your, your, your point of view on this. What is amazing is I have not seen or heard one time the mention of the unborn child. No. This is why in our, in our talks, in our conversations, we want to remind people that that's what we're talking about. No, of course, we, we want women to have rights, but sometimes we forget that there's another person involved when we talk about this topic. That's been the debate over abortion since day one for thousands of years. When you're talking about abortion, there's another life involved. Yeah. 
We're talking about two people now. We're talking about two people. Now, in just a minute, let's get into the actual language and why that's so significant. If this were to become the trend in the nation, why you wouldn't hear the mention of the unborn child ever again. back on the public square, Alan C. Duncan, Rob Walgate. I'm Dave Zanotti. This is a special election update for the nation because we are being besieged by calls, texts, information, what happened in Ohio uh, in this past week and what does it mean for the nation? And this uh, involves our monthly update, which you can have right now. Please visit us at aproundtable.org or the public square. We can send you one in your email box. We can send it to you in your post office box. And for at least the next three or four months, please Get a hold of this newsletter because every single month we're going to be working to update the nation. You mentioned earlier, Dave, the hype that was around the August special election. And both sides were, in essence, saying it was the most important election of their lifetime. Well, they're going to be saying the same thing three months later. It seems like every time we see or hear a campaign commercial, whether it's for the presidency, whether it's for a constitutional amendment, whether it's for a local tax levy, it's the how many times can we tell people it's the most important election of their lifetime? This goes back to what I said earlier. I mean, people are still rocked by it. Said I asked, I, I asked the question out loud. What we're being asked all over the place is why can't pro life leaders work together? And I said the answer is simple: it's human sin. It's it just it's it's just that people people are into this issue for so many reasons. Now, I want to explain that every now and then, by the merciful grace of God. Pro-life leadership repents, realizes what's really at stake, and says, let's let's do work together. And we do have allies that we work together in the pro-life community that we've had a relationship with for a long, long, long time. And some of them are almost secret supporters in the sense that they don't wear their pro-life credentials out there on their sleeve. But when it comes to time in their field of influence to speak a word, they're unafraid to do so. And they're very effective. Um, so, so yes, there are rifts in the pro-life community because the people that are pro-life are also humans fallen prone to sin like everybody else and stumble. Okay. We all need forgiveness. We all need help. Now around the nation, this is the bellwether issue that's going to trigger the 2024 election. And it's going to happen. The voting will begin in Ohio in about 60 days from the time that you begin to listen to this. So we're in a position where how can we rally forces now, first off, do we have a case? The answer is we do have a case. We have a very strong case. First off, we have a mandate. Uh, let me read the, the passage that leads off the monthly update. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Uh, this morning, I woke up reading Psalm 27, Psalm 37, and Psalm 73. Now, around here, people start smiling when I say that because they know I'm in trouble. When I'm yeah. reading Psalm 27, <laughs> Psalm 37, and Psalm 73, yeah. I'm about to jump off the cliff myself. You needed to take your, you need to eat your vegetables. But, this yeah. morning. I <laughs> need to get talked <laughs> off the wall by the scriptures. It also means we're going to wake up to 3.30 emails <laughs> from DZ <laughs> that came throughout the night. I can tell you what passage of scripture he's been reading based on the time I receive emails in my inbox when I wake up in the morning. And in case you're wondering, we have a 24-hour shift mode here at the American Policy Roundtable between now and election day. That means that at any point in time, you can be called and asked to come to work or get to work uh, at any time because there aren't enough of us to run normal shifts. All right, we need all the help we can get. Well, it's it's funny that you that you mentioned the round the clock work. We have we have people still continuing to to build our building as yes. we speak. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we're, we're we're hanging screens. We have construction work in. I just I just saw uh, Brad who helps us with our electrical and our phone systems right. and internet. He just came in the door. There, there's more people here than I knew um, <laughs> existed. And there's but, more coming. Yeah, I got to get to the airport to pick up more people yeah, that are coming in. Yeah. All so right. all hands on deck. It right is now. all hands on deck. And it by the way, in case you're wondering who's paying for all this. Let me tell you something. We don't have some uh, some out-of-state super sugar daddies that are out there dropping millions of dollars on us right now. I'm telling you right now, that's not happening. That's why the screen's being installed right now and yes. not three years not ago. Not three years yeah. ago. Right, right. So, <laughs> well, I want to hit on that out-of-state, if I may. Sure. Because it 
plays into the amendment discussion. Um, but Let me be careful when I say that because all of our donors are from out of state. Right, yeah, I yeah. Mean, because we, we're in three states. We have right. three offices. So we, we, we're not apologizing the fact that we raise money from supporters. We don't raise money. God lets these folks graciously give us money. We receive contributions from thousands of people around the country. Now, it's not millions. It's thousands. And right now, the number is about 3,000. We'll be the full disclosure. We have about 3,000 people who, and, and companies and, and foundations that give to us. And, and none of them are the giant super sugar daddies that you hear and read about. And none of them are based out of D.C. think tanks. And none of them are based out of Council on National Policy uh, coterie meetings in which someone is selected to be the million dollar, five million dollar uh, you know, prize winner. No, I, I remember, Alan. So people started. on their homes, there's people driving home in their trucks. It's, it, it's from the people who pray every day for America. We had a gentleman that walked over from the factory I'm pointing at, from, uh, I literally can see through our windows. He walked over and said, I listen to you guys. How can I help you this coming fall? He it, asked this morning, he walked over. Uh, this uh, is his, this is his card right uh, here. Thanks be to God. This, ha- this, oh, all right. Now the, uh, well, that well, to me but, is a gift. I, I needed to hear that. Uh, I, Thank I, you, sir. God bless you. What's his first name? Uh, well, I don't want to say his name, but, but I want, but he knows who he is. And I want to say thanks for doing that. Okay. Yes. Amen. Thank, Thank you. Alan, I can remember when I started at the round table in 2003, I went, to an engagement with DZ and he was speaking and I'll never forget. He, he got into finances and he said, I can, I I was like, Whoa, okay. He said, I can promise you one thing. If you send us money, I can tell you what we're going to do with it. We're going to spend it. We're going to spend all of it. I was like, did he just say that out loud? On (laughs) on Monday, we just moved out more dollars than we have ever spent in a single day into any project, any 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 litigation or legislative process on Monday, we 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 went down and said, "Here's point one, two, three, four, five, six. Buy it all, order it now, and get it tomorrow. We've got to go forward on this. So we'll go broke. All right, on the contributions, we'll go broke on this because because this is about life. This is about what world we're going to live in, what world our children and our grandchildren are going to live in. Now, here's the question I've got." Everywhere we go, we hear about enshrining Ugh. the right to abortion. I hear, I heard it. I don't. Every media outlet uh, harping across this is in Washington Post, New York Times, uh, Associated Press, especially the Associated Press. They are hooked on this word right now. In fact, I'm trying to reach the Associated Press to ask them where they found it. So I'll, I'll try. Here's my question: If if we're talking about enshrining the right to abortion in our Constitution, does an altar come with that? <laughs> Well, it, it may, but it might be an altar to the wrong God. Do you realize what we're saying? We're enshrining the right to kill an innocent unborn child that has no voice or no choice in the matter. How can you even consider that kind of language? The movie, as well as the documentary on Gosnell, should be required viewing for anyone before they vote on this amendment. In November. Or whether they vote on the similar amendment that's coming in Florida or the similar one that's coming just announced this week in Arizona or the one that's coming in New York. And they're going to use the same enshrine, 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 enshrine. Where's the altar that goes with that? And what's the sacrifice that goes at that shrine? Tell me. Somebody have the courage to complete the sentence, to challenge the language, because words matter, especially when you're going to put them into your state constitution. So the state constitution is the big law in the land. And let's be very clear about something. When you enshrine a right, a human right, which has not ever been done before in this Ohio constitution, there's a bill of rights, but those rights are acknowledged as having been given by God and government protects them. Now we're inventing a right that's never been given by God, the unlimited right to destroy an unborn life, an unborn human life, even an unborn viable human life, just because the abortionist says, that's what I want to do, and the woman says, that's what I want. Now, for people that are screaming at the radio, extremist, 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 I'm not the one that's building the shrine. Extremist, this is the most extreme language I've ever seen when it comes to putting it into a state constitution. It'd be the most extreme statutory language that we've seen outside California, Illinois, and New Jersey. So... Here's the big thing that I want to talk about. And we got to move into another segment to do it. Everybody says that all the polls show that most people want abortion to be legal. 
Well, of course, most people want abortion to be legal because everybody knows there's going to be some cases where to save the life of the mother, the the pregnancy is going to be terminated. Not because the child's the enemy, because the pregnancy has gone wrong. There's, There's all kinds of small reasons and small instances, but they're real. Nobody wants to ban abortion in every circumstance, including to save the life of the mother. That's absurd. Everybody thinks we've got to be careful with this issue. We know that. But this measure goes so far in the other direction that, well, we got to talk about it on the question of viability. So we've got a section on seethelanguage.com about viability. Here's what it comes down to. In, in, in the Ohio language that's supposed to be the template now for the nation, the Ohio language basically takes the question of viability and leaves all the power, not in the hands of the legislature, but in the hands of the attending physician. Now, Alan, an attending physician in regards to an abortion is called... Uh, I think they're called an abortionist. An abortionist. So in essence, what we do is we put all the moral authority on the decision-making on viability in the hands of the abortionist. Who literally gets paid to do abortions. Exactly. Now, how did we get that transfer exclusively placed in the hands of the abortionist? When we come back, we'll go right into the language and show you that deceit. We will be right back for more on The Public Square. Spreading the light of liberty across the land. Now back to the public square. We're back on the special election edition of the public square. It's an election that just happened, an election that is coming. In fact, two elections that are coming. Because what's going on right now at Ground Zero in Ohio is clearly, according to the New York Times, Washington Post, Associated Press, and so many more, is basically the template for the nation, not just this year, but next year. Okay. The Ohio language, which enshrines abortion, lays on the temple of that enshrinement, a transfer of authority. It says that the legislature may, it doesn't even say the legislature, it, it talks about the fact that the question of viability can be a question that's that's discussed, right? However, abortion may be prohibited after fetal viability. Okay. Abortion may be prohibited after fetal viability. Maybe. 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 So how would that happen? Well, it would either come by an initiation of a constitutional amendment by the people. Yeah, but it goes on to say, the language goes on to say, but no case may an abortion be prohibited if in the professional judgment of the pregnant patient's treating physician is necessary to protect the pregnant patient's life or health. The second way it could be amended by the legislature. It's an invitation to say, well, the legislature can now deal with viability. Okay, that's the way the language is presented, which is completely and absolutely deceptive. Right, because they talk about fetal viability in the definition section of this. And they say under no circumstances can any measure change this because the final say on this will be in the hands of the abortionist. This is determined on a case-by-case basis. They say that in the definition of fetal viability. They say the fetal viability means the point in a pregnancy when, in the professional judgment of the pregnant patient's treating physician, the fetus has a significant likelihood of survival outside the uterus with reasonable measures. Boom. Who's making that call? The abortionist. Does the legislature have any role? No. Does zero. the people have any role? They have no authority. Zero. It's all transferred to the abortionist. This is determined on a case-by-case basis. Basically, the, the abortionist says this is this is viable, this is not. Right? Secondly, the question becomes to what is the reason that has to be given in regards to viability? Well, if the health of the mother's in question the abortionist also has the ultimate concern, the ultimate decision to be made. All the authority in this language is transferred to the abortionist. But the term health is not defined. No, it's not. So it could be mental health. It could be any type of health you think of. Extremist, extremist, extremist. They'll scream. Well, then why didn't they define it? We don't want to be extreme. And they'll change the the subject. And you know what they'll say? They'll say, in Ohio, there was a 10-year-old girl who got pregnant who had to be transferred to Indiana to have an abortion because of the extremist in Ohio and their abortion rules. Um, Okay. 
50 years, Roe versus Wade, 50 years, we have one example of a situation after post Roe in a situation with the 10 year old girl. Okay. Now, that whole situation was mishandled and radically misrepresented. But, okay, they're going to make that claim. Their own language permits that a child trafficker could take a 10-year-old pregnant child into an abortion clinic, have that abortion performed on that minor child without anyone in custodial care even knowing that it happened. Well, and that's what I was going to say. If someone is going to say that they're very concerned about 10-year-olds, they may have wanted to mention any kind of age range in this language at any point. Exactly. There is no protection for minors whatsoever. No parental notification, no waiting period, no nothing. It's a free-for-all because they built a shrine. Ooh, can I actually read the definition of enshrine? I've got the Webster's Collegiate Dictionary over here. I, I grabbed it off the shelf here. Enshrine, to enclose in or as in a shrine, hence to cherish as sacred. Sacred. See the language.com, see the language.com, see the language.com. Who's the extremist? Now we're creating a right on pen and paper, a right to unlimited death for the unborn child. But it is much larger than that because this is not a shrine to the right to abortion. This is a shrine to the right to reproductive decisions. Reproductive decisions. Let's read that portion, Rob. The beginning of this amendment says every individual has a right to make and carry out one's own reproductive decisions, including, but not limited to, decisions on one, contraception, two, fertility treatment, three, continuing one's own pregnancy, four, miscarriage care, and five, abortion. Now, that first language says including, but not limited to. So what would number six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 be? And since the definition of reproductive decisions is not expanded. It's not, it doesn't say this is what, it says, well, these, these five things are included. This is a right now, the right to reproductive decisions, but not limited to. So if a person creates any scenario that they quantify as a reproductive decision, whether they're doing it for commercial purposes or religious purposes or anything else, and they come into a courtroom saying, I have the right to do this based on this because it says, but not limited to, and this is my world of reproductive decisions. You don't have the right to stop me. Now, on the funny side, we've said, in other words, um, uh, Dr. Evil could move to Ohio and create Minimi here. You could, you could literally say that reproductive decision would be cloning. W- wouldn't it be? It would have to be. It would have to be. Or how about fetal experimentation? Or how about selling fetal body parts? Well, they don't define reproductive decisions. So if they don't, um, I mean, it's their language. Why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't define they define it? Their- because they don't know what they're doing. This is an emotional tirade. This is an enshrinement of a temple. This is trying to create the godlike powers to create a right. It's hard to do that, by the way. If this were to pass, how could you legally stop, let's say, a 12 year old? girl from dating a 35-year-old man if they both say this is consensual. and Because there's no age limits or protections. Well, then the, the screaming at the, at the radio, extremist, extremist, extremist. There are laws that prohibit that. Excuse me. Let's get something very square here. America, please, with all the love I can muster and forgive the frustration. We've been up for the last 20 hours on this, literally. All right. You, you, we must understand the Constitution is superior law to a statute. You can't write a statute that violates the Constitution. The courts will strike it down every time. What that means is when that situation comes forward and a person decides to go to court and say, this is my right to reproductive decisions. It's who I am. You can't stop me. How's the court going to stop them? Maybe that was number six, seven, eight, nine, or 10 that wasn't mentioned. Right. So this essentially would wipe off uh, those kind of uh, statutory laws off the books. For- Eventually, and this is exactly the argument, I'm telling you, if Antonin Scalia was here right now, he'd make it. And we have been talking to lawyers all over the country, and they're telling us, keep going, keep talking, you're right, including l- lawyers 
who are high-ranking lawmakers as well, who have watched this and they're literally pulling their hair out saying, this is nuts. All right, we got to go to a break. Uh, the update you can get at uh, aproundtable.org or you can get it at thepublicsquare.com and you can visit seethelanguage.com. And for those people that might be screaming at the radio or you have relatives or friends or work coworkers that are going to be screaming at the radio, here, let them scream at a website. Scream at seethelanguage.com. The whole country should see this language and understand what we're up against. Yes, they should. Thanks, Dave. Uh, but now we are going into a break and some stations may be cutting away right now. If your station does, you can find us at thepublicsquare.com or the Public Square mobile app in your app store. Look for the lamppost. But for everybody else, we'll be right back after the short break. Please stay with us. We will be right back for more on the Public Square. Thanks for joining us for this special election edition of the Public Square for the entire country. Reflecting on what's going on at Ground Zero right now on the debate regarding abortion and so much more. Um, Dave Zanotti, Rob Walgate, and Alan Duncan doing this emergency session. The whole team can't be here because we're recording this thing in very odd hours uh, with the latest sets of news pieces that have come in and, and because of tremendous demand. Um, so now all forces have to rally to defeat the singular amendment in 2023. Pro-life sources from around the country must come together. Now, how do we do that? First off, it's going to take a lot of forgiveness because there's a lot of hurt feelings out there over how we got in this mess in the first place. Um, and and as, as, as people of faith, it's just, and this is between us and the Savior. We have been forgiven. If we want forgiveness, we have to give forgiveness. That's what the Lord's Prayer ends up saying. I need forgiveness, so I've got to forgive. It's just that simple. This isn't personal on any set of situations. There have been radical disagreements over strategy. There's been tremendous amounts of confusion around the country, particularly in the state of Ohio. This issue is not confusing now. This amendment is right here. That's why our campaign is seethelanguage.com. Because we think people are smart enough when they see it in the language as it's written, they'll see the threat to civil liberty and even civilization. And that's why on the website, we put both sets of language. We put the clean language. Yes. The language that the abortion industry is proposing to be enshrined. We, we put the shrine and the temple and, and, and the altar right there. You and can look right at next it. to it. When you read the clean language, you're going to have questions. Mm -hmm. And we have many of those same questions. So you're going to see a marked up version right next to it that our entire team here at the American Policy Roundtable took time to um, dissect and ask those important questions. The ones that, quite frankly, if this was to be in the Ohio Constitution, would be litigated. Yeah. The courts would be answering many of those same questions, and they'd have the same questions we have, and they would say, wait a minute here. This is vague and open-ended, and they can do what they want to do. Now, it, let's say this man amendment is defeated because people look at the language and go, this is nuts. That doesn't mean the fight's over. Because I can assure you what the pro-abortion industry will do. The abortion industry will come right back with a modified proposal. This is where they've stepped into a trap of their own making. This is where the stone that they rolled out to roll over others comes back rolling back on them. Because in this amendment, we have their true agenda. This is the one time they said it all out loud. And it's right there in writing. It's on the ballot. This is where they want to go. This is why you cannot call people who are exposing what they're doing extremists because we're exposing the extremism. They're the ones that wrote this thing. Well, and, and I haven't heard any, we've said this before on the, this broadcast, but I haven't heard them encouraging people to read their language that no, they wrote. Not at all. They're, they're, not, they're, yeah. they're not saying, we're really proud of this. You should look at it and see what's in it. We're the only people that I've heard saying, hey, Look at the language. Yeah. See, see the language com. That should tell you a lot. And again, I'm going to tell you, you could be a pro-abortion advocate and vote against this because it is so far over the top. Now, they'll come back in a few years chastened by the, the rebuke if the people of Ohio reject this amendment and try to come back with something else. I'll tell you now, in case I'm not here then, remember, this time they told you the whole truth. 
This is what they're really after. Yeah. That's why you've got to see the language.com. I, I, I feel like it's the old high school story, right? Someone wants to stay out till midnight, so they ask to stay out till 3 a.m. first. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, yeah. you negotiate down. It's, yeah, yeah. And it it's is, like a car dealership. But it's in very this, adolescent. Yeah. But in this instance, they have put it all out there. And they will have to defend that language going forward for years to come. It, would there be a way to to defeat this this fall and then for good guys to write good language? Well, Alan, thank you, because herein lies the biggest problem of all. And it's, it's sorry, if, look, God have mercy on my soul. I don't want to say anything that will offend anyone in any way, shape, or form. But the truth sometimes is painful. The biggest problem here is post Roe versus Wade, the abortion industry went on the offensive and the pro-life community is catching up. It's as if the pro-life community wasn't ready. And where they weren't ready was they were sitting back with their trigger laws, laws that would go into effect as soon as Roe was off the books, then these other laws. Well, guess what? The pro-abortion industry said, I'll tell you what we're going to do with your trigger laws. We're going to sue you and tie you up in state courts on every single one of them. Then we're going to go on the offensive and start moving constitutional amendments to enshrine. We're going to create the right, that, and then we're going to enshrine it on our altar inside our temple. This is their religion. They're using those kind of sacred words. I didn't, I'm not saying that they are. Okay, so they're on the offense. Yes, Alan, we must come back to the reality of resolving this in a fair and civil public debate not by creating a right, but by understanding how to deal with this. Not everybody's going to get everything that they want, but there should be a reasonable way based upon the consent of the governed to protect human life, to protect women's rights, and to come to a place where we can do this and live together. And now, not everybody's going to be happy. The battle may go on for another 50 years, and, and that's fine. But that's the way in a civil society you deal with this. And in the meantime, while you're dealing with the legal side, you never, ever stop making the case for the beauty, the wonder, the miracle of human life. You must do both. Now, um, friends, if we don't get off of our convenient selves, if we don't shut off the streaming video and maybe tell our kids you can't be in everything you want to be in because we're going to be busy for the next few months or the next few years, the other side's going to win because they're working really hard. And if you look at the funding that came into this Ohio amendment, it's all the people you hear about all the time on talk radio. It's the Tides Foundation. It's the Soros money. It's all of those networks. The uh, All of those, we've been talking about them on the air here for years. Yes, this is the real thing. That, that illustrious person that's out there named George Soros. Oh, no, he's here. He's And so are all of those networks that they have put together. This is what they want. This is their shrine. This is their temple. This is their sacred place. This is what they want. Now, is that scary? Yes. What do we do? We pray. We pray because we are not battling against flesh and blood. We're battling against principalities and powers. We're battling against an idea. We're battling against the death eaters. We're, bal we're battling against the very hatred that emanates from the Garden of Eden. We're battling against evil. We pray. Secondly, we've got to have the tools. See the language.com. We've got those. Third, we got to tell somebody. You got to walk across the street like the guy did this morning and, and tell somebody. You got to go tell, talk to people. This is so much more important than a 30 second commercial. And so many times we think the political decisions that we make are, should be based on a 30 second commercial. We have to be intentional about this. We have to know it, we have to understand it, and we have to be able to communicate effectively with others so that they know the truth. It's that important. You've got to be registered to vote. You've got to tell everybody you know in Ohio, everyone, every business contact you have, are you registered to vote? Please, you can send them a copy of this newsletter. Get the newsletter. You can send it electronically to them in the email blast. You can start the conversation. And then we've got to give. We've got to give more joyously and heartily than we've ever given before because this is going to take serious money. Now, we will never match the massive revenue of the Death Eaters that's, that's coming into any given state. We've got the same problem coming up in Ohio. We've got the same problem coming up in New York, same problem coming up in Arizona. And each of those states are going to need help. We must reinvigorate the movement of support. Now, every dollar you give to the American Policy Roundtable or to Evergreen Leadership Fund or to the public square on this is going to get spent to tell this story, see the language. 
But we have to pray that God will open the eyes of the people that are reading as well. We need help. It's interesting that this would start in Ohio. It's the last place anybody saw it coming. It's not the first time this has happened. Ohio has a motto that we actually went to court with the governor to defend and won in federal court. And that motto is, with God, all things are possible. We've got to believe that's true. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Rob. And thanks to you, our friends of the public square, for listening. Sounds like we've all got a lot of work to do this coming fall to protect that first right, life. To hear this broadcast again and to share with a friend, find the Public Square app in your app store, look for the lamppost, and listen to these episodes just about anywhere else you listen to audio programming. And remember to visit and share seethelanguage.com. The Public Square is a broadcast service of the American Policy Roundtable.